Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Philosophossum. So Dave Rubin appeared on Joe Rogan's podcast. Now, neither of these gentlemen weren't introduction. They're some of the biggest and most well-known political channels on YouTube. Way bigger than I could ever even imagine of being. But I always figured this would make for an interesting combination, since these two gentlemen are like complete polar opposites. On one hand, you have Joe Rogan, who disagrees with everybody he talks to. And then you have Dave Rubin, who agrees with everybody he talks to. Now, the whole conversation is actually three hours long, so it wouldn't really be feasible for me to respond to the whole thing, so I'll focus on a small 10-minute segment that's considered by most to be the most controversial part of the conversation. This would be the segment where they discuss the importance of building codes and environmental regulations. It should be fun. Let's get into it. But just generally, what problem would you... Everything you're building here right now, right? Do you want the government to tell you how to do all these things? No, I'd prefer to be able to build things however I please. Release my architectural creativity uninhibited. If the government wants to release general guidelines to follow, I'm perfectly cool with that. But if they're imposing them on me at gunpoint, well, we have a problem. And all the regulations that you got to have your electric thing this far from this and like all... The the regulations like that for construction are important, though. You do have to make sure that people don't do stupid shit. Well, I mean, people do stupid shit with or without regulations. Heck, a lot of times people do stupid shit in compliance with regulations. Shane Killian mentioned some examples of this in his video where he argues against Tom Hartman making similar arguments for regulation. But because America does not use the precautionary principle, toxic asbestos was used in our homes, our workplaces, even our schools well into the 1970s. Lie! 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 The reason they were being used so much is because government building codes required it! According to a report published in the Texas Administrative Law Journal, quote, What neither party brought to the attention of the court in Commonwealth v. Johnson Insulation, apparently because they didn't know it, is that these asbestos-containing products have been installed in compliance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts State Building Code, which specified, approved, and in some types of service, required the use of asbestos. But but sure you don't have a power line near a water line. But power lines are usually near water lines. In a lot of cities, all your utilities just go through one conduit under the side walk and you know, there's a lot of but i would put most of that on the builders though they want to build things that are good now i get it oh that's not true did you hear that everybody if you work in construction joe here just made sweeping generalizations about your intentions work ethic any amount of pride you take in the work that you do listen people no, no people are going to build corners all the time like you have to have regulations when it comes to construction methods they, or people are going to get fucked they cut regulate they cut corners when there are regulations anyway they do. They would cut a lot more if there weren't regulations. I'm not totally... You go to third world countries and look at construction methods, they're fucking dangerous. Yeah. That's why schools collapse on kids in foreign countries sometimes. A lot of these third world countries also have shitty economies. The reason construction methods tend to be more dangerous in these places is because they can't afford higher quality building materials or better training and education for construction workers. It's like... Well, I'm not complete. I'm not telling you that I'm against all regulation, period. That's okay. where, but that's where I said intellectually, I like that argument because you could make a, I think you can make a very sound argument that competition would force people to do better work. Like if you're a plumber, you have a vested interest in doing the best plumbing job you can so that people will rate you on Yelp so that you will get more work. You don't have a vested interest in cutting corners. Now you might, right? You're gonna push it as much as you can to save as much time and energy and money as you can. Also reducing business operating costs isn't necessarily the same thing as cutting corners. It's entirely possible that a company or business could find a better way of doing something that achieves the same quality result but at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. But once you go over that edge, yeah, you don't want to be known as the guy that the you tighten something too much that you flooded the house or when you're building a house. You're thinking logically, though. When when people fuck things up and short things and do things terrible, they're not thinking logically. But they're I don't think... So what makes people in government any more likely to think logically than the people in the private sector? It's the Shit government. Heads. I don't think it's the government that they're like, ah, the government gave me this regulation, so that's why I'm going to do it right. Well, if you they didn't I mean? have any regulations, there'd be no incentive whatsoever to do it right. No, there would be an incentive. That, if they knew there were no inspectors, no one was going to check their stuff and make sure that their stuff was up to code. Well, who said there'd be no inspectors? You can have private sector companies inspect the quality of construction 
Listen, man, I was in no. construction my whole life. My dad was an architect. Yeah. I've been in construction since I was a little kid. Just because you worked in a certain industry for a long time doesn't mean you know everything about it or that you can make sweeping generalizations about everyone who works in that industry. I've worked in IT my whole life. I don't think I'm smarter than Bill Gates or to know the intentions and work ethic of every single Oracle employee. You fucking need regulations. These guys, a lot of people that are in construction, they're, they'll do whatever the fuck they can to make money. And it's not good for the people that have the house because they might have that house for five, ten years before that problem manifests itself. Uh, it looks like Mr. I've worked in construction my whole life doesn't understand the concept of maintenance. Any structure will have problems manifest itself given enough time, regardless of how well constructed it is. Anyone who's ever seen the History Channel documentary Life After People will know that any structure given enough time will develop problems, if not periodically maintained. Now, generally speaking, there is a trade-off between what you pay up front for the initial construction versus what you pay later during maintenance. Generally speaking, the more you pay up front during construction, the less you end up paying over time for maintenance. Now, in a free market, where people are free to determine for themselves what budget works best for their circumstances, people would be free to decide whether they want to focus the expense on the upfront construction or the eventual maintenance. But a lot of these building regulations take that choice away. Your only choice now becomes one with a higher upfront cost. So if you're lower class and don't have very much credit history, you're boned. The, the people who are establishing these codes are licensed builders or people that have been involved in construction for a long fucking time. People who establish these codes are probably from actually bigger construction companies, and they want to make it as difficult as possible for anyone to compete with them. So they end up writing these codes to be artificially strenuous on smaller companies to prevent them from entering the market. This is more or less how regulation works. A business gets someone sympathetic to their interests in that office and then uses that position of power to craft regulations beneficial to their business specifically. And they know what's safe and what's not safe. That's why those codes exist. It exists to protect the consumers. You can't just protect the consumers through the marketplace. The market, all the market means is a word that just describes people interacting voluntarily, usually on an economic basis. They're trading, they're exchanging things. Like, it's the market when you go to the mall or you go to the grocery store and go, oh, I'm going to buy this, oh, that's too expensive. They're deciding, that the people who run the store, they're deciding how much they're going to sell things for. You're deciding what you're willing to pay, what you want to buy, what you don't. You might walk in and say, I don't want any of this and leave. Nobody points a gun at your face and says, you have to buy from us. It's all voluntary. It's amazingly organized. There's amazing cooperation on a huge scale and it's all voluntary. That is the market. That is free exchange, free uh, interaction between human beings. That's all the market means. And it's important to understand this because if somebody is saying, oh, you just trust the market, what they're literally saying is they're insulting you for trusting people being free and not violently controlled. Because so it I'm not takes a long for time for these problems to become a real issue. And these problems could potentially damage everybody in the neighborhood. It's not just going to affect the person on this one lot. Like if a fire starts, it burns all the houses in the neighborhood. Or if a flood happens and it floods everyone downhill, it's, it's a real problem. So the concept of tort negligence would still exist under the non-aggression principle. Suppose an entire neighborhood sustained damage because of one poorly constructed building. If the residents of that neighborhood could prove that it was because of that building, they could go to private court and sue the construction company for negligence. Like Absolutely. You have to be real careful with construction. I get it. And, uh, you know, my dad wasn't in construction, so I'm not privy to, like, all of that, the little stuff. But I genuinely believe that, as a general level, people have a vested interest in, especially now, because of phones and apps and Yelp and all of those mm -hmm. things, doing good work because that's how you will get more work. It, I you, agree. You're never going to remove the people who will do shoddy, shitty, malicious shit. But you can keep them at bay with regulation. What makes you so certain of that, Joe? I'm going to go out on the hunch and say the types of builders that do shitty work and scam people are probably not the kind of builders who are getting licenses and permits or making it easy for the government to find them.
I, I think so this is where I'd say you can have some regulation. regulation. Yeah. Educated regula regulation. People who actually understand what's going on. But what if they don't understand what's going on and now everyone's forced to follow their regulations regardless? Or what if they flat out don't care or are incompetent? It seems to me like this type of system would introduce a single point of failure. And, you know, make sure that someone doesn't do something stupid with a power line or someone do something stupid with the, the way they constructed main beams where they, they're just subject to collapse. But what if I'm able to experiment and I find a new way of constructing main beams such that they can provide the same level of stability but using less materials. This is another problem with regulations like this. It hampers the ability of businesses to innovate, to come up with solutions or new ways of doing things that perhaps can achieve the same or even better result but using less resources. Like that's important yeah. because most people buying a house don't know what the fuck they're looking for. Most people getting a house built, they have no idea about construction methods and they need someone to inspect things and make sure that it's up to code. That's why code exists. It's very important. I agree. It is important. That's why we shouldn't have government monopolizing it. It's true that the average person in the housing market doesn't know a whole lot about construction or what to look for when evaluating the safety of a building. But just like any other problem, it creates a market for those willing to provide a solution. Yeah. I, so I'm not, I'm not totally with you on that. Like I do think most, I think most of it, probably 90% of it would be who has the most vested interest to build a good house. It's the builder because he wants more work. He doesn't want the house to collapse because then he'll be out but of work. The, I'm telling but you, I, man. No, I got you. I got you though. It, I get it that These it will not are always. Yeah. There's a lot so of them that are jerk So construction may be a. Let's for the sake of argument assume that this is true, that most people who work in construction are jerk offs to use Joe's words. How many non jerk offs do you think are out there who are passionate about construction and want to build high quality homes but don't have the time money or resources to hop over the red tape specific thing you know yeah, what i mean it's it's a dangerous thing too because it's where you sleep it's where your kids sleep it's it's you know you just I, I, I think there's a lot of idealistic notions about deregulation. And I think there's a lot more idealistic notions about regulation. You often hear libertarians, especially anarchists, compare government to a religion. And this especially becomes relevant when discussing regulations. According to theists, God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. Let's start with omniscient. In order for the government to be able to enforce these regulations, they'll have to know all the different places where something is being built. Not only that, but they'd have to have the resources and manpower to make sure that they're all following the code. Therefore, the state would also need to be omnipotent. And finally, assuming that they are aware of any sort of construction project that goes on anywhere, and the manpower and resources to enforce the code on them, they also have to be willing to exercise these powers, and actually be using them to protect people, not to further their own interests. Thus, the state is omnibenevolent. So, omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, government is a religion. Now, some may argue that we're not saying that the government is all-powerful or all-knowing or all-benevolent, but that they have knowledge, power, and benevolence above the average person. But you're still ascribing to government things beyond which the average person has, which is still making the claim that government is something more than a group of plain Jane homo sapiens like the rest of us. And yeah. I think there's, there's some consumer protection has to be put in place. Well, who says only government can provide consumer protection? I mean, in the private sector, we have companies like Consumer Reports, Yelp, Underwriters Laboratories, the Better Business Bureau, the list goes on and on. Because people don't have the time to spend uh, all this time researching construction methods and making sure everything's done correctly and be there and make sure that the joists are a certain width and they have a certain amount of support. Like all that stuff has to be done by people who understand code. Assuming that the government regulators understand code correctly and aren't just on the take or just, you know, uh, you know, just basically just taking money and signing off on things. I mean, this is a good point, actually. If you're concerned that construction workers will cut corners or do a lousy job in order to maximize their own self-benefit, I don't see why that same concern shouldn't apply to the bureaucrats you want monitoring them. In fact, if anything, there's a greater risk for the bureaucrat because unlike the construction company, there's no way to revoke his funding if he does a shitty job. No, when no, I got they, my house, they inspect things, man. Have you ever had a construction project done? Yeah. Notice how Joe just dodges the question like that. Dave points out a glaring inconsistency in his ideology, and Joe is just like, uh, next topic. Yeah, well, I got my house last year, and we had to go through all the inspections and had right, several you guys didn't come build back, it, and right? they, we, we didn't build it, no. Right. There's a big difference between yeah. an insurance inspector yeah. and a code inspector. Code inspectors are very different. When yes, here's the difference. The insurance inspector has a vested interest in the safety of the house. If the house collapses, then and the insurance company has to pay the owner, and that money could potentially be coming from that inspector's paycheck. Now, the code inspector, on the other hand,
other hand, has no stake whatsoever in the safety of the home. If your house collapses, they don't have to pay you jack. And it doesn't matter how well he does his job, because if you refuse to pay him, the IRS has a bullet with your name on it. So on the one hand, you have one entity who loses money if the house collapses. On the other hand, an entity that gets paid whatever the fuck happens, who do you think is going to do a more thorough inspection? You're having a house built. Yeah. And I've had construction projects where I had to explain to people and go through it with, with builders. They're, they're making sure that the house doesn't fucking fall on you, that the, the power lines, you know, are, are done correctly, that all the electricity is done correctly, the pipes are laid in correctly, your septic system or your sewage system is done correctly. Yeah. That, do, you, do you think that could be privatized? I know it can be privatized. In most cases, it already is. I've already demonstrated why there's a good chance the inspection done by your insurance company is probably a heck of a lot more thorough than the one done by government. Then. See, cause again, I'm not, I'm just, I just think it's an the interesting- regulations? Yeah. How would it? Just quickly Google Underwriters Laboratories. They're a private sector company that inspects and ensures the safety of all the products that we buy, or at least a very good chunk of them. How that would you, you could have there company? would be no incentive. There very well would be incentive. Buyer doesn't want to buy a house that will collapse. The realtor doesn't want to sell a house that will collapse. And no insurance company wants to insure a house that will collapse. Right off the bat, that's at least three different entities that have an interest in having the home inspected without state coercion. Well, well no, you could have companies that would that their job would be to, to make inspect. sure to inspect. Yeah, and you but they hire... wouldn't have they wouldn't have the threat of law to to enforce these things. Well, why does the solution have to involve threats? Why not offer positive incentives? It's like if someone is is if someone is building something and they're not up to code, they lose their license and they can't build. Why should I need permission from the government to enter into voluntary agreements using my own property? The only license I should need is from the customer. Right. If you privatized it, what's the incentive for them to follow the, the guidelines? Well, seeing as it is based on the free market, there isn't a single definitive answer. But I'll propose one potential solution. So the customer, the builder, and the inspector would form a three-way contract. Whereas the builder only gets paid once the inspection is passed. When the inspector signs off on the house, at that point, any responsibility for the house collapsing is transferred from the builder to the inspector. So the builder is incentivized to have the house inspected because the liability is transferred and the inspector has a incentive not to be biased toward the builder because if they sign off on a house that ends up being shoddy and it collapses, they're the ones who are liable. There, That should cover pretty much any authoritarian objection to this system. Yeah, so this is, this is where I'm not telling you that I'm calling for all this. I just think intellectually it's just an interesting space to... To argue something because even though i am taking dave's side on this argument i still have to be fair and call out any poor reasoning he uses as well it seems like dave is unwilling to commit to his arguments like it seems like he wants to ride the fence more than take a strong side one way or the other like every time joe brings up a counter argument he wants to backtrack and say well no i'm not saying get rid of all regulations by trying to ride the fence it essentially gives him an easy and convenient escape if joe brings up a point he doesn't feel he can handle discussing it appears as if Dave didn't really do a whole lot of thorough preparation for this, which is why a lot of these counter-arguments from Joe sort of catch him off guard. Even hardcore Dave Rubin fans agree that he wasn't really on his A-game during this interview. I think that there's more, the more that you can give to people to freely do what they think is right, I mm -hmm. think generally they will. Like, again, I get it. There's going to be some real shitty construction people out there. Yeah, um, you know who you should have on to talk about this, and I think people have looped you in before, is Yaron Brook from... Uh, from Ayn Rand Institute, he's because he's no, obviously no big. Me in with him. No, no, all right. No. So I'll be happy. Maybe to do if they it. have, I haven't paid attention. Okay, so I'll, I'll be happy to do it. He's a really interesting guy who's moved, those moved my Rand thinking people, a little bit on this. Those Ayn Rand people are fucking harsh. They like ideas, man. They're, those are they're with this. also Ayn Rand isn't the only libertarian thinker. There's also John Locke, Immanuel Kant, Milton Friedman, Lysander Spooner, Ludwig von Mises. They're yeah. not the most fun people on the yeah. on the planet, but I generally I generally like them because they just want they're kind of live and let live. Mm -hmm. that, that's really it. Like that's like the crux of it, pretty much. Is that really the crux of it? I mean, yeah. The, people think that there's like sort of a cruelty aspect to it. Well, I'm very curious to see the cruelty aspect to an ideology that believes people should be free to do as they please, as long as they're not hurting anybody. The well, Ayn Rand philosophy. Well, they believe in in rational self-interest which mm -hmm. if you say self it makes people think you're evil but i but we all basically operate in rational self-interest all the time right but espousing it 
Well, that's the the thing. It's like proclaiming it is the thing that people go, oh, you're 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 essentially setting up the idea, the Gordon Gecko idea. Greed is good. Rational self interest is not the same thing as greed. Rational self interest just means that people have a tendency to behave in ways that they perceive to lead to the most benefit. Some people may perceive that altruistic actions and generosity is what leads to the greatest benefit. Yeah, I, I kind of buy into that idea. Do you buy into greed is good? Yeah, basically. Well, yeah, do you think the people who farmed your food, built your house, designed your car, etc., etc., like you? Heck, they probably don't even know you. N not greed to destroy the world, but if you do, you, Joe, do what is good for you. And right. by extension- Is that greed? Well, that's or good. Or is that ambition? Well. All right, exactly. That's my point. Right, By but doing... that's where it gets conflated. Another thing that gets conflated is greed and egocentrism. If I say, I want an Xbox, that's greed. If I say, I want an Xbox, no matter at whom's expense, that's egocentrism. Isn't it? Right, so, with, so without whittling it to the definition of greed versus ambition, it's like... You do what's good for you, but but it doesn't mean you're just running this like rampaging program to destroy the world in the name of Joe Rogan. You're right. doing what's good for you because you actually like your audience and you want them to learn. You you want to have money so that your family can live in a house that you can afford and that you can send your kids to good schools and all of those things. That's all rational self-interest. If at the same time you were running a nuclear power plant and you were Mr. Burns and you were dumping in the river, well, no, that's actually no longer rational self-interest because now you're polluting the very environment that you live in so mm -hmm. rational so I mean, the who key... takes care of that who regulates that anyone who lives downstream would presumably regulate that if you live downstream from someone who's polluting a river then that pollution is interfering with your right to use that river they're interfering with your property rights and you would have a right to take action against them whether that means going to private court and suing them seeking uh, redress whatever the case may be so that, they, is so that where the government comes in? If someone is polluting someone else's property, interfering with their property rights, then yes, the government has the same right to step in and enforce their property rights as anyone else. The problem is when government passes regulations or steps in to protect the environment, a lot of times this interferes with people's property rights. For example, a lot of wetlands protection legislation interferes with the rights of property owners to build stuff on their own land. Something as simple as a small puddle, which just so happens to have frogs living in it, can be considered a wetland. So those guys, I, I don't want to speak for. Well, the, who gets you in trouble if you, in your opinion, if you if you're this deregulation guy? So private courts or the people who enforce property rights? Yeah. Who goes after you when you dump shit into the river? Presumably, it would be the DRO that you're contracted with. So I'm not saying there should be no regulation. I just was saying that I like this. Generally, I like this line of thinking. There has to be some regulation. I agree. You can't. But what I would say so is, you that's know, that's where the regulation comes in. Let's when put you it this way: the environment. Yeah, that I would say there has to be some, but I've had uh, some interesting people on conservatives who are doing, doing uh, environmental stuff from a conservative perspective, that there's ways to make money actually in green stuff. That's right. The free market encourages efficient resource use. Companies are incentivized to keep their operating costs as low as possible. This means that they'll want to consume as little resources as possible, and the effect of this is that there's less intrusion on the environment. In green products, of course. And, and in uh, look at Al Gore. Yeah, well, look, yeah, he's. Making, I don't know that he's creating anything other than movies, but he's making. Well, he's, he's making a lot of money. A lot of money in green corporations, right? Yeah. So that, but that's him doing it privately, right? You'd see a lot more of this protecting the environment in the absence of government. Concerned citizens coming together to voluntarily take action rather than waiting for a monolithic bureaucracy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But what is like? What's the solution if someone pollutes? If you're not going to have regulation, what is the solution if someone does something that's illegal? Well, if you're not going to have regulation, it wouldn't be illegal. But your question is... Well, it's illegal to dump things into the river, right? I mean, it's just illegal. Right, so if, that's not a matter of regulation. So it's already illegal to pollute rivers. Isn't there already some legal mechanism in place to prevent that behavior? Like what benefit would there be from adding additional regulations? I mean, polluting, will, willful poisoning of rivers I'm sure is actually terrorism. Right. Morality can exist in the absence of laws and regulations. That's exactly what libertarians argue. Right. It would be a bunch of like... So what those guys would argue is what I said before, which is that ultimately, especially now because of technology, like in the old days, so like every time someone cuts regulation, I've heard Bill Maher say this a lot, they're going to start polluting the river immediately. That implies that these businessmen, whatever they're, you know, whether, whatever they whatever industry that they're in, that they're immediately going to be like, ha, the regulation's gone, start polluting the water. Yeah, Dave has a good point here. 
It's not like regulations are the only or even the main thing that prevents a lot of the pollution. For example, the oil industry used to produce a lot more pollution than they do today. So after crude oil was refined, once they extracted the gasoline, whatever was left would have been dumped into the water. But thanks to free market innovation, people were able to find uses for the byproduct, and now we have stuff like plastic and rubber and asphalt. This free market use of resources that were already there vastly, by several orders of magnitude, reduced the amount of pollution produced by the oil industry. We live in a time now where everyone's walking around with an iPhone, where maybe 50 years ago you could have got away with a lot of bad shit, right? Mm -hmm. Coal miners that were breathing all kinds of horrible shit that nobody was ever going to find out about, where now everybody is walking around with Snapchat and Instagram and blah, blah, blah. So a lot of the stuff would be exposed more so that all of the things that we've been talking about for the last couple hours about, about people getting involved, a lot of the things I think would start self-regulating. Social media can be a very effective way to hold companies responsible and increase consumer awareness. Here's a, a recent example that's rather famous. Number 15, Burger King foot lettuce. The last thing you'd want in your Burger King burger is someone's foot fungus, but as it turns out, that might be what you get. A 4chaner uploaded a photo anonymously to the site showcasing his feet in a plastic bin of lettuce with the statement, this is the lettuce you eat at Burger King. Admittedly, he had shoes on, but that's even worse. The post went live at 11.38 p.m. on July 16th, and a mere 20 minutes later, the Burger King in question was alerted to the rogue employee. At least, I hope he's rogue. How did it happen? Well, the BK employee hadn't removed the EXIF data from the uploaded photo, which suggested the culprit was somewhere in Mayfield Heights, Ohio. This was at 11.47, Three minutes later, at 11.50, the Burger King branch address was posted with wishes of happy unemployment. Five minutes later, the news station was contacted by another 4 chaner And three minutes later, at 11.58, a link was posted, BK's Tell Us About Us online form. The foot photo, otherwise known as Exhibit A, was attached. Cleveland Scene Magazine contacted the BK in question the next day. When questioned, the breakfast shift manager said, Oh, I know who that is. He's getting fired. Mystery solved by 4chan. Now we can all go back to eating our fast food in peace. But again, and then I won't say it again, I'm not for just deregulating everything. I just think there's probably better ways to do it than just having the government come in and say, this is what you got to do and now figure it out. Because the government isn't that good at most things. What about positive regulations? Couldn't the government offer rewards to companies that do good things as well as punish companies that do bad things? I mean, there's examples of this already being implemented. Governments often give subsidies, grants, more favorable contracts to companies that offer better services to consumers. Yeah, I know what you're saying there, but uh, I do think that Obviously, there has to be laws in place, uh, specifically laws in place that protect people from someone doing something that's going to damage all the other people in the community. Well, libertarians aren't against that. We do believe in a system of law that protects your person and your property. That's what the non-aggression principle is. Since the non-aggression principle is objective and based on logic, it's much easier to implement and apply than the arbitrary whims of politicians. Yeah. Well, and by the way, that so you can do that from, look, the government's supposed to protect your life and your property. I mean, that's a very simple libertarian thing. You know what I mean? Like, so that there's a good argument there for why you could have some level of regulation. Right, but I don't think it's just uh, like specifically in terms of like someone polluting rivers. I don't think it's good enough to Snapchat about it. Well, nobody ever said just Snapchatting about it was enough. We said that it's one among many potential solutions that can be implemented. You can Snapchat about it and supplement that with other methods to address the problem. For example, you could start an organization that's dedicated to cleaning up the environment or boycotting businesses that cause environmental harm and then use social media as a way to gather support. I think people should be locked up and go to jail. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. Holy shit. Ladies and gentlemen, you do not fuck with Joe Rogan's environment. If they find out that someone's dumping toxic waste into the river because it's too expensive to process it and get it removed and, and put in some place where it's, it's you know, safe, th that's a crime. Yeah. Well, I'm all for fining those people and having the companies fire them and all those things. As far as putting them in jail, I don't know that I'm... Lock them up. What would that accomplish, though? Wouldn't it be more effective to just make them pay for the environmental damage they cause? 
I mean, if they're in jail, they're not working, so there's no way for them to earn the money to pay for that damage. So that would be kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, I don't know that I'm... Get them off the streets. <laughs> take the money. Give it to Bernie's kids. Yeah, Bernie's kids may need some help since he dropped out of the race. Yep, that's right. Bernie dropped out. Well, so much for sticking it to the 1%. Speaking of taking your money and giving it to someone, links to my Patreon and PayPal will be in the description. Do you want to see more well-constructed arguments and less nasty river-polluted arguments? Subscribe and watch more videos. As always, this has been Philosopossum, making stupidity play dead. Have a good one.